Shabbat Shalom, everyone. This is the seventh of the twelfth month on our Creator's calendar, and it is the nineteenth of the second month, or February, on the Gregorian calendar. And we are continuing with our reading and study of the recognitions of Clement. <clears throat> we just finished book three, and we are starting on the beginning of book four. And just for a recap, Kepha, Shimon Kepha had had disputations with Simon the Magician, and they went for about three days back and forth disputing doctrines, and then that culminated with Simon the Magician fleeing for his life, thinking that they were going to discover his, you know, evils and whatnot, which we'll get into a little more as we read here. But now Kepha is going to be following after him and uh, bringing the good news as he goes. So this is book four, chapter one, the halt at Dora. This is, so you know, they're going from Caesarea Stratanos, which is in the land of Yisrael or Yahuda at the time. And they're heading north up the coast as they go towards Tripoli and eventually to Rome, but that isn't in the book here. So chapter one, it says, having set out from Caesarea on the way to Tripoli, we made our first stoppage at a small town called Dora because it was not far distant. And almost all those who had believed through the preaching of Kepha could scarcely bear to be separated from him, but walked along with us again and again, gazing upon him, again and again, embracing him, again and again, conversing with him, until we came to the inn. On the following day, we came to Ptolemaeus, where we stayed ten days. And when a considerable number had received the word of Yahuwah, we signified to some of them who seemed particularly attentive and desired to detain us longer for the sake of instruction, that they might, if so disposed, follow us to Tripoli. We acted the same way at Tyre and Sidon and Beritus, and announced to those who desired to hear further discourses that we were to spend the winter at Tripoli. Therefore, as all those who were anxious followed Kepha from each city, we were a great multitude of elect ones when we entered into Tripoli. On our arrival, the brothers who had been sent before met us before the gates of the city, and taking us under their charge, conducted us to the various lodgings that had been prepared, or sorry, that they had prepared. Then there arose a commotion in the city and a great assemblage of persons desirous to see Kepha. And when we had come to the house of Maro, in which preparation had been made for Kepha, he turned to the crowd and told them that he would address them the day after tomorrow. Therefore, the brothers who had been sent before assigned lodgings to all who had come with us. Then, when Kepha had entered into the house of Maro and was asked to partake of food, he answered that he would by no means do so until he had ascertained whether all those that had accompanied him were provided with lodgings. Then he learned from the brothers who had been sent before that the citizens had received them not only hospitably, but with all kindness, by reason of their love towards Kepha. So much so that several were disappointed because there were no guests for them, for that all had made such preparations that even if many more had come, there would still have been a deficiency of guests for the hosts and not hosts for the guests. Thereupon, Kepha was greatly delighted and praised the brothers and Baruch them and requested them to remain with him. Then when he had bathed in the sea and had taken food, he went to sleep in the evening and rising as usual at cock crowing while the evening light was still burning, he found us all awake. Now there were in all 16 of us, viz. Kepha and me, Clement, Nisita and Aquila, and those 12 who had preceded us, 
saluting us then, as it was his wont, Kephas said, Since we are not taken up with others today, let us be taken up with ourselves. I will tell you what took place at Caesarea after your departure, and you will tell us of the doings of Shimon here. And while the conversation was going on these subjects, at daybreak, some of the members of the family came in and told Kepha that Shimon, when he heard of Kepha's arrival, departed in the night on the way to Syria. And that would be Armenia. They also stated that the crowds thought that the day that he had said was to intervene was a very long time for their affection and that they were standing in impatience before the gate, conversing among themselves about those things that they desired to hear and that they hoped that they should by all means see him before the time appointed. And that as the day became lighter, the multitudes were increasing and that they were trusting confidently whatever they might be presuming upon, that they should hear a discourse from him. Now then, said they, instruct us to tell them what seems good to you, for it is absurd that so great a multitude should have come together and should depart with sadness, though or through no answer being returned to them. For they will not consider that it is they that have not waited for the appointed day, but rather they will think that you are slighting them. The harvest plenteous. Then Kepha filled with admiration. See, he's not upset that they didn't listen, but he, he looks at it with a positive attitude here. He sees the benefit and fulfillment of our creator's word. He says, then Kepha filled with admiration says, you see, brothers, how every word of y'all who has spoken in foretelling is fulfilled. For I remember that he said, the harvest indeed is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Ask therefore the master of the harvest that he would send out laborers into the harvest. Behold, therefore, the things that are foretold in a mystery are fulfilled. But whereas he said also, many will come from the east and the west, from the north and the south, and will recline in the bosom of Abraham and Yitzhak and Jacob. This also is, as you see, in like manner fulfilled. So I entreat you, my fellow servants and helpers, that you would learn diligently the order of preaching and the ways of absolutions, that you may be able to deliver the inner beings of men, who by the secret power of Yahuwah acknowledge whom they ought to love, even before they are taught. For you see that these men, like good servants, long for him whom they expect to announce to them the coming of their master that they may be able to fulfill his will when they have learned it. The <laughs> Sorry about that. Starting again right here. It says that they may be able to fulfill his will when they have learned it. The desire, therefore, of hearing the word of Yahuwah and inquiring into his will, they have from Yahuwah. But this is the beginning of the gift of Yahuwah, which is given to the nations, that by this they may be able to receive the halakha, or path, of truth. It's also called the walk, right? For so also it was given to the people of the Hebrews from the beginning, that they should love Moshe and believe his word. Whence also it is written, the people believed Yahuwah, and Moshe his servant. What therefore was the peculiar gift from Yahuwah toward the tribe of Hebrews, we see now to be given also to those who are called from among the nations to the belief. But the method of works is put into the power and will of everyone, and this is their own. But to have an affection towards a teacher of truth, this is a gift of the Shamayim father. But deliverance is in this, that you do his will of whom you have conceived a love and affection 
through the gift of Yahuwah. Least that saying of his be addressed to you that he spoke. Why call you me master, master, and do not what I say? It is therefore the peculiar gift bestowed by Yahuwah upon the Hebrews that they believe Moshe, and the peculiar gift bestowed upon the nations is that they love Yahushua. For this also is, or sorry, for this also the master intimated or hinted when he said, I will confess to you, Father, Eloah of sky and earth, because you have concealed these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes, by which it is certainly declared that the people of the Hebrews who were instructed out of the Torah did not know him. But the people of the nations have acknowledged Yahushua and venerate him, on which account also they will be delivered, not only acknowledging him, but also doing his will. But he who is of the nations and who has it of Yahuwah to believe Moshe ought also to have it of his own purpose to love Yahushua also. And again, the Hebrew who has it of Yahuwah to believe Moshe ought to have it also of his own purpose to believe in Yahushua, so that each of them, having in himself something of the el breathed gift and something of his own exertion, meaning belief, which comes from above, you can't come to him unless you're drawn, and then your own exertion is your obedience, right? may be perfect by both. For concerning such a one, our master spoke as of a rich man who brings forth from his treasures things new and old, meaning from both Moshe, the original covenant writings, and Yahushua and what he foretold in the renewed covenant writings, right? Chapter six, a congregation says, but enough has been said of these things for time presses, and eager attention of the people invites us to address them. And when he had thus spoken, he asked where there was a suitable place for discussion. And Maro said, I have a very spacious hall that can hold more than 500 men, and there is also a garden within the house, or if it pleases you to be in some public place, all would prefer it, for there is nobody who does not desire at least to see your face. Then Kepha said, Show me the hall or the garden. And when he had seen the hall, he went in to see the garden also, and suddenly the whole multitude, as if someone had called them, rushed into the house and from there broke through into the garden where Kepha was already standing, selecting a fit place for discussion. But when he saw that the crowds had, like the waters of a great river, poured over the narrow passage, he mounted upon a pillar that stood near the wall of the garden and first saluted the people in his usual manner. But some of those who were present and who had been for a long time distressed by demons threw themselves on the ground, while the unclean Ruachoth entreated that they might be allowed but for one day to remain in the bodies that they had taken possession of. But Kepha rebuked them and commanded them to depart, and they went out without delay. After these, others who had been afflicted with long-standing sicknesses asked Kepha that they might receive healing. And he promised that he would entreat Yahuwah for them as soon as his discourse of instruction was completed. But remember what scripture says, before you ask, I will hear you, right? But as soon as he had promised, they were freed from their sicknesses. And he ordered them to sit down apart with those who had been freed from the demons as after the fatigue of labor. Meantime, while this was going on, a vast multitude assembled, attracted not only by the desire of hearing Kepha, but also by the report of the cures that had been accomplished, which is the whole purpose of miracles, 
It's to get them to be in a state of wonder where they're going to be receptive to, to believing the truth. But Kepha beckoning with his hand to the people to be still and setting the crowds in tranquility began to address them as follows. It seems to me necessary at the outset of a discourse concerning the true worship of Yahuwah. First of all, to instruct those who have not as yet acquired any knowledge of the subject that throughout Yahuwah must be maintained to be without blame by which the world is ruled and governed. And he'll explain later that having wrong thoughts of anything other than excellence concerning Yahuwah is what can even fatally pollute your immersion after you've been immersed in the belief. It says, moreover, the reason of the present undertaking and the occasion offered by those whom the power of Yahuwah has healed suggest this subject for a beginning, namely, to show that for good reason very many persons are possessed of demons, that so the justice or righteousness of Yahuwah may appear. For ignorance will be found to be the mother of almost all evils. But now let us come to the reason. When Yahuwah had made man after his own image and likeness, he grafted into his work a certain breathing and odor of his el-breathed might, that so men being made partakers of his only begotten might through him be also friends of Yahuwah and sons of adoption. Whence also he himself, as Yahushua, knowing with what actions the Father is pleased, instructed them in what way they might obtain that privilege. At that time, therefore, there was among men only one worship of Yahuwah, a pure mind and an uncorrupted spirit, or Ruach. And it was before he came, if you went perverted, you were cast away. It was only after it. all of the patriarchs from Adam through Noah, they couldn't continue in sin. None of them turned away from the truth. They walked in, as the shepherd of Hermas says, they were carried about, they bore the names of the virgins all the days of their life, and they were never without them. So they had the characteristics of Elohim without having his name. But that was the required state, a pure mind and an uncorrupted Ruach. And for this reason, every creature kept an inviolable covenant with the race of man. For by reason of their fear or reverence of the creator, no sickness or bodily disorder or corruption of food had power over them. Whence it came to pass that a life of a thousand years did not fall into frailty of old age. But when men leading a life void of distress began to think that the continuance of good things was granted to them, not by Elohim's bounty, but by the chance of things, and to accept as a debt of nature, not as a gift of Yahuwah's tobim, or goodness, their enjoyment without any exertion of the delights of the el breathed compliance, or compliance, that being uh, not having to labor right? Men, being led by these things into contrary and disobedient thoughts, came at last at the instigation of idleness to think that the life of Elohim was theirs by nature without any labors or merits on their part. Hence, they go from bad to worse to believe that neither is the world governed by the providence of Yahuwah nor is there any place for virtues, since they knew that they themselves possessed the fullness of ease and delights without the assignment of any works previously, and without any labors, were treated as the friends of Yahuwah. By the most righteous judgment of Yahuwah, therefore, labors and afflictions are assigned as a remedy to men languishing in the vanity of such thoughts, 
And when labor and tribulations came upon them, they were excluded from the place of delights and amity. Also, the earth began to produce nothing to them without labor. And then men's thoughts began turned in them. They were warned to seek the aid of their creator and by prayers and vows to ask for Elohim's protection. And thus it came to pass that the worship of Yahuwah, which they had neglected by reason of their prosperity, they recovered through their adversity. And their thoughts towards Yahuwah, which indulgence had perverted, affliction corrected. So therefore Yahuwah, seeing that this was more profitable to man, removed from them the ways of benignity and abundance as being hurtful, and introduced the way of vexation and tribulation. But that he might show that these things were done on account of the ungrateful, he translated to immortality a certain one of the first race of men, because he saw that he was not unmindful of his favor, and because he hoped to call on the name of Yahuwah, while the rest who were so ungrateful that they could not be amended and corrected even by labors and tribulations were condemned to a terrible death. Yet amongst them also he found a certain one who was righteous with his house, whom he preserved, having enjoined him to build the Tava or Ark, in which he and those who were commanded to go with him might escape when all things should be destroyed by a deluge, in order that the immoral being cut off by the overflow of waters, the world might receive a purification, and he who had been preserved for the continuance of the race, being purified by water, might anew repair the world. But when all these things were done, men turned again to impiety, and on this account, Torah was given by Yahuwah to instruct them in the manner of living. And if you remember, we just read that before we started recording, that the, the Torah was added because of transgression. Now you can see the context for what he meant there. The transgression be, being after the flood, the idolatry and the, the witchcraft that came about from Babylon that was introduced among men that Abraham repented of. Okay, these are the things that the Torah was meant to correct. But in process of time, the worship of Yahuwah and righteousness were corrupted by the unbelieving and the immoral, as we will show more fully by and by. Moreover, perverse and erratic religions were introduced, to which the greater part of men gave themselves up by occasion of holidays and solemnities, instituting drinking and banquets, following pipes and flutes and harps and diverse kinds of musical instruments, and indulging themselves in all kinds of drunkenness and luxury. This drunkenness does not just mean intoxication with wine, but it has to do with any type of opiates or anything that can get you in an intoxicated state. Hence, every kind of error took rise. Hence, they intervented or they invented groves and altars, flesh and victims. And after drunkenness, they were agitated as if with mad emotions. By this means, power was given to the demons to enter into the minds of this sort, so that they seemed to lead insane dances and to rave like Brachianalines, which, uh, Brach, uh, Bacchia, Bacca, right? Brachia, Brachialis, I'm not saying that right. It comes from the Hebrew for weeping, and that's like the weeping for Tammuz. Uh, it, it all ties together with that, but that was actually found in the Alexander Hislop's The Two Babylons. He has a great multitude of etymologies and the, where words come from, from Greek directly from the Hebrew out of the into the Greek for a whole bunch of the false mighty ones and how it all ties together with this stuff. But to continue, it says, hence were invented the gnashing of teeth, 
and bellowing from the depth of their bowels, hence a terrible countenance and a fierce aspect in men, so that he whom drunkenness had subverted and a demon had instigated was believed by the deceived and the erring to be filled with, it says, the deity, or they thought that they were filled with the, the spirit of their false mighty one. Hence, since so many false and erratic religions have been introduced into the world, we have been sent as good merchants, bringing unto you the worship of the true Yahuwah, handed down from the fathers, and preserved as the seeds of which we scatter these words amongst you, and place it in your choice to choose what seems to you to be right. For if you receive those things that we bring you, you will not only be able yourselves to escape the incursions of the demon, but also to drive them away from others. And at the same time, you will obtain the rewards of ageless tobe things. But those who will refuse to receive those things that are spoken by us will be subject in the present life to diverse demons and disorders of sicknesses. And their Ruach Oath or inner beings, rather, after their departure from the body, will be tormented forever. For Yahuwah is not only good, but also righteous. For if he were always good and never righteous to render to everyone according to his deeds, goodness would be found to be unrighteousness. For it were unrighteous if the disobedient and the obedient were treated by him alike. Therefore, Demons, as we have just said, when once they have been able, by means of opportunities afforded them, to convey themselves through base and evil actions into the bodies of men, if they remain in them a long time through their own negligence, because they do not seek after what is profitable to their inner beings, they necessarily compel them for the future to fulfill the desires of the demons who dwell in them. But what is worst of all, at the end of the age, when that demon will be consigned to ageless fire, of necessity, the inner being also that obeyed him will with him be tortured in ageless fires, together with its body that it has polluted. And this is something that goes right in hand with learning how to be healthy, right thinking, leading from sickness, leading to not being sick anymore he's saying this very same thing it's obedience to the things enjoined that bring deliverance all through scripture if you take it as a simple parable it like what it says in the psalms the word was sent to them and healed them and then you read all the things where our mashiach went every time someone came with an ailment or they cried out for deliverance Sometimes you would help without any further necessity, but their belief, right? And then the action that corresponded with their belief, or he would tell them to do something and their obedience brought it because they believed what he said. But it's all about doing what the word enjoins that brings healing. And these are the parables that he literally walks out in the flesh. This is now that the demons are desirous of occupying the bodies of men this is the reason, which you'll also find in the book of Hanok, chapters 10 through 16, on the judgment of the unclean Ruach Oath, uh, of the, the inner beings of the giants and the children of the fallen messengers. And you'll also find this in Yobelim chapter 10. Kepha, throughout the course of this book, also goes into great detail about the authority they have, what they can do and why so it says they are ruach oath or they are spirits bearing their purpose turned to immorality therefore by immoderate eating and drinking and lust they urge men on to sin but only those who entertain the purpose of sinning like what yaakob says right in his epistle who, while they seem simply desirous of satisfying the necessary cravings of nature, 
give opportunity to the demons to enter into them, because through excess they do not maintain moderation. For as long as the measure of nature is kept and legitimate moderation is preserved, the mercy or loving kindness of Yahuwah does not give them liberty to enter into men. But when either the mind fail or falls into impiety, or the body is filled with immoderate meat or drink, then, as if invited by the will and purpose of those who thus neglect themselves, they receive power as against those who have broken Torah imposed by Yahuwah. So what you think can cause you to be sick or under sin because you're breaking what he said to do. It's exactly what it go, the detail of what those other videos go into detail about, the actual science behind it. And for anyone on the video here, I'll share a link in the description for the set of videos. You can look at them yourself, but they go over the, the actual medical information behind this stuff that we're reading right here. This is chapter 17. The Basora gives power over demons. All right. I was asked to read this measure again, so I'm going to back up and read this section one more time. It says, for as long as the measure of nature is kept and legitimate moderation is preserved, the mercy of Yahuwah does not give them liberty to enter into men. But when either the mind falls into impiety or the body is filled with immoderate meat or drink, then as if invited by the will and purpose of those who thus neglect themselves, they receive power as against those who have broken Torah imposed by Yahuwah. Right. You see then how important is the acknowledgement of Yahuwah and the observance of Elohim or of the El breathed obedience, which not only protects those who believe from the assaults of the demon, but also gives them command over those who rule over others. And therefore, it is necessary for you who are of the nations to betake yourselves to Yahuwah and to keep yourselves from all uncleanness, that the demons may be expelled and Yahuwah may dwell in you. And at the same time, by prayers, commit yourselves to Yahuwah and call for his aid against the impudence of the demons. For whatever things you ask believing, you will receive. So if you're having these thoughts pop up in your mind that you don't want, that are not of the truth, you don't have to actively engage in thinking on them. You can choose not to, or to use the word as a counteraction to these things. And that will literally help them not settle in your mind. You can also pray like he's saying, and if you ask for help, he will help you to have these things not be effective, but you actually have to believe. And in, in the proportion to your belief, it will be done for you. This is why it's foundational. If you can find two or more witnesses that are clearly established in the scriptures, you can ask for it with a guarantee that it's established fact, because that's what he said to do. And you can prove it like a lawyer in a law in, in, against the bar with the jury as your peer there. You just establish the facts. You call for his aid. You rely on the truth in his word, and he will do it for you, provided you actually believe him. He says, but even the demons themselves, in proportion as they see belief grow in a man, in that proportion they depart from him, residing only in that part in which something of infidelity still remains. But from those who believe in full belief, they depart without any delay. For when a inner being has come to the belief of Yahuwah, it obtains the virtue of Shamayim water, by which it extinguishes the demon like a spark of fire. There is therefore a measure of belief which, if it be perfect, drives the demon perfectly from the inner being. 
but if it has any defect, something on the part of the demon still remains in the portion of infidelity. And it is the greatest difficulty for the inner being to comprehend when or how, whether fully or less fully, the demon has been expelled from it. For if he remains in any quarter, when he gets an opportunity, he suggests thoughts to men's hearts. And this is explained as theta waves as opposed to alpha and beta waves in your mind. Just so you know. And they, not knowing whence they come, believe the suggestions of the demons as if they were the perceptions of their own inner beings. Thus they suggest to some to follow pleasure by occasion of bodily necessity. They excuse the passions of others by excess of gall. They color over the madness of others by the veminence of melancholy. And even extenuate the folly of some as the result of abundance of phlegm. And this is showing how demons manifest these things in your body when you hold to wrong stuff. It's just not going into too much detail on cause and effect for them. But he's giving you some examples of it. But even if this were so, still none of these could be hurtful to the body except from the excess of meats and drinks. Because when these are taken in excessive quantities, their abundance, which the natural warmth is not sufficient to digest, curdles into a sort of poison, and it flowing through the bowels and all the veins like a common sewer, renders the motions of the body unhealthy and base. Therefore, moderation is to be obtained in all things, that neither may place be given to demons, nor the inner being being possessed by them, be delivered along with them to be tormented in ageless fires. There is also another error of the demons, which they suggest to the senses of men, that they should think that those things that they suffer, they suffer from such as are called Elohim, in order that thereby offering Zabachim or sacrifices and gifts, as if to propitiate, uh, sorry, as if to propitiate, propitiate them. Sorry, <laughs> propitiate to uh, try to make remedy by offerings. Right? They may strengthen the worship of false religion and avoid us who are interested in their deliverance, that they may be freed from error. But this they do, as I have said not knowing that these things are suggested to them by demons, for fear they should be delivered. It is therefore in the power of every one, since man has been made possessed of free will, whether he will hear us to life or the demons to destruction. Also to some, the demons appearing visibly under various figures, sometimes throw out threats, sometimes promise relief from sufferings that they may instill into those whom they deceive the opinion of their being Elohim, or in more modern times, they appear like UFOs. And if you want a, a modern day witness for that fact, there's a gentleman named John Todd who was alive. He was martyred in the 70s or in the 80s rather, but he was a converted witch, an ex-Druid, that came out of the Illuminati of the Council of 13, very high or very powerful in the witchcraft, if you will. And he was exposing all of the stuff that you can read about here too, as he comprehended it. Um, he mentioned specifically that his sister mocking people and having fun at their expense in Oklahoma was casting spells. And he was, she was the reason in the seventies, they had a lot of the UFO sightings around that area at that time another witness to the fact that witchcraft and ufos go hand in hand is that there was a ufo sighting with the apparition of mary at fatima that the catholics had it was one of their miracles around the turn of the 19th century or the 20th century rather but to continue real quick and just finish the chapter it says and that it may not be known that they are demons 
but they are not concealed from us who know the mysteries of the creation and for what reason it is permitted to the demons to do those things in the present world, how it is allowed them to transform themselves into what figures they please and to suggest evil thoughts and to convey themselves by means of meats and of drinks consecrated to them into the minds and bodies of those who partake of it and to concoct vain dreams to further the worship of some idol. All right, this is chapter 20, Folly of Idolatry. <clears throat> and yet, who can be found so senseless as to be persuaded to worship an idol, whether it is made of gold or of any other metal? To whom is it not manifest that the metal is just that which the artificer please? How then can the Almighty be thought to be in what that which would not be at all unless the artificer had pleased? Or how can they hope that future things should be declared to them by that in which there is no perception of present things? For although they should be, or for although they should divine something, they should not straightway be held to be Elohim. For divination is one thing, Elohim, right? Divinity, it says, but being Elohim is another. For the Pythons, if you're not familiar, the Pythons were false foretellers of Apollyon or the Greek version of that name, right? The Pythons also seem to see Yet they are not Elohim, and in short, they are driven out of men by the Nazarene. And how can that be the same Elohim that is put to flight by a man? But maybe you will say, what as to their effecting cures, and their showing how one can be cured? On this principle, medical doctors ought also to be worshipped as Elohim, for they cure many. And in proportion as anyone is more skillful, the more he will cure. Whence it is evident that they, since they are demonic spirits, know some things both more quickly and more perfectly than men is in italics because it was added. Or for emphasis, I'm not, I'm not certain. For they are not retarded in their learning by the heaviness of a body meaning they can go in and see what's wrong with you. They don't have to, they don't have a body that prevents them. And therefore they as being Ruachoth or spirits know without delay and without difficulty what medical doctors obtain after a long time and by much labor. It is not wonderful therefore if they know somewhat more than men do, but this is to be observed that what they know they do not employ for the deliverance of inner beings, but for the deception of them, that by means of it they may indoctrinate them in the worship of false religion. But Yahuwah, that the error of so great deception might not be concealed, and that he himself might not seem to be the cause of error in permitting them so great license to deceive men by divinations, and cures, and dreams, has of his mercy, or loving kindness, furnished men with a remedy, and has made known, or sorry, and has made the distinction of falsehood and truth patent to those who desire to know. This, therefore, is that distinction. What is spoken by the true Eloah whether by foreteller or by diverse visions, is always true. But what is foretold by demons is not always true. It is, therefore, an evident sign that those things are not spoken by the true Eloah, in which at any time there is falsehood. For in truth there is never falsehood. But in the case of those who speak falsehoods, there may occasionally be a slight mixture of truth to give, as it were, seasoning to the falsehoods. But if anyone says, what is the use of this? 
that they should be permitted even sometimes to speak truth, and thereby so much error be introduced amongst men. Let him take this for answer. If they had never been allowed to speak any truth, then they would not foretell anything at all. While if they did not foretell, they would not be known to be demons. But if demons were not known to be in this world, the cause of our struggle and contest would be concealed from us, and we should suffer openly what was done in secret. That is, if the power were granted to them of only acting against us and not of speaking, which it was uh, since the Industrial Revolution, this is something you can find revealed to a man named Monroe. I can't remember his first name, but he wrote a book called A Journey Through the Spirit or the, A Journey Through the Supernatural. And he was into what he called spirit worship, low levels of it back in the 1920s, 1930s, while he was a young man. And he came out of that becoming a Seventh day Adventist eventually. And then he exposed all these things in a book. But he mentions that it was. They had a conclave where they were just talking about what they were going to do, the adversary and his hierarchy for the, the future. And they wanted to talk about how they would come, you know, how they would respond to the Industrial Revolution and what was going to happen to the world. So they, their intention, and this is something that was pushed even to this day where you, you don't really believe them, was to get men to believe that he wasn't real or that demons aren't real. And that's what a lot of this push is for today. And while there's a, a naturalistic explanation for everything, but that's a separate thing for now. I just thought it was interesting because that's something that you can see right here too. He alludes to it. If you didn't know they were really here, you would have the means of our contest hidden from us, which is true for the most of the world today. But now, since they sometimes speak truth and sometimes falsehood, we ought to acknowledge, as I have said, that their responses are of demons and not of Yahuwah, with whom there is never falsehood. It says, but if anyone, proceeding more curiously, inquires, what then was the use of Yahuwah's making these evil things? which should have so great a tendency to subvert the minds of men. To one proposing such a question, we answer that we must first of all inquire whether there is any evil in substance. And although it would be sufficient to say to him that it is not suitable that the creature judge the creator, but that to judge the work of another belongs to him who is either of equal skill or equal power. Yet, to come directly to the point, we say absolutely that there is no evil in substance. But if this be so, then the creator of substance is vainly blamed. But you will meet me by saying, even if it has come to this through freedom of will, was the creator ignorant that those whom he created would fall away into evil? He ought therefore not to have created those things who he foresaw would deviate from the path of righteousness. And this is the section that we're about to read in the Syriac version. It says that when all men subject their conscience to Yahuwah, that's when things will change and you won't have this evil going on anymore. All right. But this one doesn't quite have that. So we'll, we'll compare and I'll see if it's the same chapter or not. But I think this is the right this is the right spot. It says, now we tell those who ask such questions that the purpose of assertions of this sort made by us is to show why the immorality of those who as yet were not did not prevail over the tobim or goodness of the creator. For if, desiring to fill up the number and measure of his creation, he had been afraid of the immorality of those who were to be, and like one who could find no other way of remedy and cure except only this, that he should refrain from his purpose of creating, lest the immorality of those who were to be should be ascribed to him. 
What else would this show but unworthy suffering and unseemly feebleness on the part of the Creator, who should so fear of acting, who should so fear the acting of those who as yet were not, that he refrained from his purposed creation? But <clears throat> just a moment. All right. So it's uh, chapter 25, evil beings turned to good account. But setting aside these things, let us consider this earnestly, that Yahuwah, the creator of the creation, foreseeing the future differences of his creation, foresaw and provided diverse ranks and different offices to each of his creatures, according to the peculiar movements that were produced from freedom of will. So that while all men are of one substance in respect of the method of creation, there should yet be diversity in ranks and offices, according to the peculiar movements of minds, to be produced from liberty of will. Therefore he foresaw that there would be faults in his creatures, and the method of his righteousness demanded that punishment should follow faults for the sake of amendment. It behooved, therefore, that there should be ministers of punishment, and yet that freedom of will should draw them into that order. Moreover, meaning the fallen messengers and demons freely chose to do evil that caused them to be in the situation they're in, right? They freely chose to be the ministers of punishment. Moreover, those also must have enemies to conquer who had undertaken the contests for the Shamayim rewards. Thus, therefore, neither are those things destitute of utility that are thought to be evil, since the conquered unwillingly acquire ageless rewards for those by whom they are conquered. But let this suffice on these points, for in process of time, even more secret things will be disclosed. Now, therefore, since you do not yet comprehend how great darkness of ignorance surrounds you, meantime I desire to explain to you whence the worship of idols began in this world. And by idols I mean those lifeless images that you worship, whether made of wood or earthenware or stone or brass or any other metals. Of these, the beginning was in this wise. Certain messengers, having left the course of their proper order, began to favor the vices of men, and in some measure to lend unworthy aid to their lust, in order that by these means they might indulge their own pleasures the more, and then that they might not seem to be inclined of their own accord to unworthy services, taught men that demons could by certain arts, that is, by magical invocations, be made to obey men. And so, as from a furnace of workmen or, and workmanship of immorality, they filled the whole world with the smoke of impiety, the light of piety being withdrawn. All right. I think we might have to stop here because this, this one's going a lot longer than I was imagining, but it really gets into some great information um, that we can talk about in a moment. Just, just hold on. All right, so we're going to stop here for this week, and we will continue with chapter 37 or 27 here with Ham, the first magician, next time. So thank you all for joining us, and you all have a wonderful week and Shabbat.